Oppression is a monster that has been loosed upon the world, unrestrained and unchallenged, so it can clear a path for its masters to pillage cultures, destroy entire communities, and steal knowledge, power, and capital that never once belonged to them. And so often, marginalized communities like my own are the ones most preyed upon because we still, after thousands of years, do not have the collective power necessary to in mass slay the monster. To be oppressed is to be lesser. To be lesser is to be inferior. And to be deemed inferior by whomever controls society is to feel the walls closing in around you every waking moment of your life. To feel hunted, othered, and like an alien still living on your terrestrial home. This is how the trans community, black community, indigenous community, and every single minority feels in the decaying empire that is modern America. Even though we're still marching, protesting, and fighting like hell to even be considered worthy of the same rights given to the master race, we're still being shot dead in the streets because the mere existence of an other is enough to drive some people to murder. Despite the fact that the blood that spills out on the streets afterwards will look the same no matter who it spills from. And those of us who understand the language of oppression understand that we all have the same mark upon our backs. The mark that designates us as lesser, as inferior, as intruders. We are the same in their eyes just as we are the same in one another's eyes. But that in itself is at the heart of intersectionality, no? Unless every last one of us were to be slaughtered or disappeared, the movement towards the abolition of every unjust hierarchy will continue and the foundations of society will continue to be shaken until we at last collapse the monstrous structures that refused to grant us the nobility of being human. And we will do it together. Those who know and understand history know that every now and then very specific moments come along that give us an opportunity to make a giant leap forward in both our movements themselves and how we're moving them forward. The moment George Floyd uttered his last words, America was and is still engulfed in the righteous fury of ordinary people who are sick of police being given free reign to kill one black soul after another for no other reason than the difference of their skin. We've heard the words of Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, the Black Panthers, MLK, and countless other activists from the era of the civil rights movement echo among the crowds of those marching now just like they marched back then all for liberation. And much like what was happening in the years leading up to Stonewall, LGBTQ people still face an intense battle at home and in the courts when it comes to their right to exist in the same spaces as those in the cis community. For no other reason than our identity, we're labeled as predators, imposters, mentally ill, and a whole laundry list of colorful terms. We know what it's like to be kicked and spat on over and over again, but it doesn't stop us because it's all for liberation. We are following in the footsteps of our predecessors, and in so many ways, history is an endless cycle repeating itself on into the vast infinity of time. Ideas, movements, specific turning points in the battle between master and slave, the indigenous and the colonizer, the oppressed and the oppressor, all of these things are recontextualized and take on different forms as history follows the same beats. And what I want to do in this video is examine the connections between Stonewall, Black Lives Matter, the civil rights movement, and the modern fight for trans rights. And with the added historical context to show why, in so many ways, the fights for trans liberation and black liberation are intrinsically tied together. As Marsha P. Johnson, a black trans woman and key figure in the queer community at the time, said, you never completely have your rights, one person, until you all have your rights. The overwhelming number of medical professionals in the days of Stonewall saw homosexuality as a mental defect or maybe even a form of psychopathy and procedures such as conversion and shock therapy, forced sterilization, occasional castrations or lobotomies, or forceful damaging of one's frontal lobe to the point where they could no longer function as independent human beings were all seen as acceptable and good in the eyes of the states. If you were outed in the military, you were dishonorably discharged and prevented from ever being able 
unable to get a job, and even professors in school would quite literally threaten, gaslight, and manipulate children to scare them away from the gay lifestyle by saying, the rest of your life will be a living hell, you will be caught. As if they were being hunted. But queer people were literally being hunted down. If a gay man were to be caught by the police engaging in what they deemed as lewd or immoral behavior, said behavior was illegal in the eyes of the law and his name, and possibly even his home address, would be listed in major newspapers. Government approved target practice, or in other words, the average day of a cop. There were no safe havens for LGBTQ youth, trans people had been all but legislated out of existence, and the community as a whole was treated as a joke, or worse, as a plague. No space was given to them. The very nature of being queer was equated with degeneracy, and because of the overt evangelical and traditional culture of the time, the mere act of being visibly gay, never mind being visibly trans, was a death sentence. Many of them could go stealth in straight society due to their lighter skin, but black queer people were knocked to the very bottom rung of society, the layer considered worthy for gutter dwellers. Even after the passing of the 15th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act, those who were black and identified as queer still had absolutely nothing. But it's from that gutter that Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Miss Major, and so many other black queer and trans activists of color emerged. Despite years of destitution, homelessness, and intense persecution because they had the misfortune of existing underneath two overlapping arms of oppression, they were still able to breach the surface and rally thousands together, lighting a fire underneath the people until it exploded in the pivotal protests at Stonewall. The community wanted to be a part of mainstream society. The Civil Rights Movement, MLK, Woodstock, Women's Power, the Detroit Riots, all of this had already created a tumultuous atmosphere within society at the time. Upheaval was everywhere, but queer people were routinely left out. As we've been witnessing with our own eyes in the year 2020, when you crank the pressure high enough, something is bound to blow at some point. Protesters clashed with police outfitted with riot helmets and tear gas for nights on end surrounding the Stonewall Inn, and no matter how much brute force the police used, the people would respond in kind with more numbers and an even stronger pushback. As one protester put it, being active in these movements was a way to vent anger at being repressed. And it wasn't just queer people who were partaking in these protests. Supporters from nearby neighborhoods, members of the Black Panthers, anti-war demonstrators, and more joined ranks with the community to boost morale and aid them in this fight. And despite the media's relentless attempts to label what was happening as a local riot, claim it was just drag queens protesting when it was everyone protesting, or outright ignore it, what had been set in motion by these short, fiery nights would change not just the fights for LGBTQ rights forever, but also once again showed people how much power they possess when even a small number of them decide to act. To object to how you're treated sounds more like an uprising than a riot, no? And the contrast of queer life before this and shortly afterwards could not have been more stark. Directly after the events at Stonewall, the Gay Liberation Front, a pro-direct action and anti-capitalist union of various gay liberation groups, was formed and through its political platform denounced racism while declaring support for various third world struggles and the Black Panther Party. Not to mention they were also highly critical of the nuclear family and traditional gender roles. Not even a year later, members of the Drag Queen Caucus of the GLF, including Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, formed the group Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, or STAR for short, which focused on providing support for gay prisoners, housing for homeless queer youth, and protection for sex workers, all in Lower Manhattan. And STAR was founded with the same radical mindset as the Gay Liberation Front. In a manifesto written by STAR's members, they condemn homophobia, racism, targeted incarceration, police harassment, and the predatory behavior of men in prison against gender non-conforming and gay prisoners. They exhibited a socialist and third gender perspective, which recognizes the existence of three or more genders, thus giving support to non-binary people, and believed that personal freedom was not only dependent on their individual rights, but on the liberation of all oppressed 
peoples. Contrast this with the Mattachine Society, a precursor to the Gay Liberation Front that was far more moderate in nature, calling for peace and an end to the protests while they were happening. Because look how far staying silent, being nice, and bending to the will of the state got our community. Direct action works. We could sit here and talk all day about the virtues of electoralism or doing your due diligence at a citizen and casting a vote, but it was the blood, sweat, and tears poured out by these communities that actually left an indelible mark on society. We wouldn't have pride as it is today if it weren't for every single one of them. Imagine that, a small group of people changing history forever. It can happen again, you know? The uniting of different liberation movements tends to send a bit of a shock through society, but uh, we'll get to that. For right now, let's fast forward to today, the year 2020. Even though we're now worlds apart from the days of Stonewall and the civil rights era, and life for the black and trans communities is interminably better now than it was then, to say we've vanquished racism, transphobia, and bigotry from the country wouldn't just be hyperbolic, it'd be demonstrably wrong. Over 55 years have passed since the Civil Rights Act was written into law, but what do we actually have to show for it? The right to live, the right to have actual systemic power, the right to exist as the white community has been allowed to exist, the right to be treated like a human being in the eyes of the law. Every one of these have yet to be truly granted to the black community. They still live in a state of fear due to unrelenting assaults, arrests, and murders at the hands of the police, disproportionate incarceration that leaves their homes without parents, thus pushing them even deeper into poverty, and the inability to grasp even half of the privilege that was handed at birth to white America. Because apparently the thought of a black person being in equal standing with a white person is just too much to handle for a certain politician politicians, talk show hosts, citizens. And even though Jim Crow laws, segregation, state laws banning interracial marriage, redlining, and all forms of discriminatory practices of the time are now but dust in the winds, the hatred of dark skin is still a poison that has soaked the well of our culture all the way to the bottom. The tearing down of Confederate statues across the country is something that's been decades in the making, but in the end, symbols are just symbols. Even though it's a beautiful thing seeing these statues rightfully removed from any place or stature that would seek to glorify and or honor them, we need to keep something in mind. Removing a symbol of hate from the public eye does not remove the hatred from one's heart. And there is still an intense, deeply seated hatred amongst many white and or cishet Americans towards the black and trans communities. We can see it in the cult-like support of the police and evangelical or conservative organizations and figures who openly talk about trans people being a plague upon society or black people bumming off the governments. The continued waving of Confederate flags, which mind you is the flag of traitors and those who fought and died to keep other human beings as property, as well as the use of white nationalist symbols and language by the Trump administration, the intensification of class warfare between our communities and the powerful elites who wield systems of oppression as a weapon against us, a near exact repeat of what happened in the 1960s, the use of racially coded language and or transphobic dog whistles meant to quietly push hateful ideologies into the public sphere and thus more easily pull unsuspecting victims into said ideology. It's everywhere, quietly waiting at the corners of our peripheral vision, embedded into every corner of society. And one of the most egregious and horrific ways it manifests is the ongoing brutal murders of trans women of color. It isn't just that they're being slaughtered for existing in two marginalized communities at once. They're already being forced to live in a culture of racism and sexism and are given no respite from constant microaggressions or more blatant hate crimes, the fear of being shot dead in the streets by someone they've never met, and suffocation by a society that would rather make a joke out of them than allow them to live a normal life. 
On top of all of this, black trans women face intense scrutiny and hatred from within the black community itself. There's a causal link between poverty, a lack of access to a good education, and homophobic attitudes. More educated people are likely to be more accepting of sexualities outside of those who are cishat, and better education typically means less affiliation to conservative religions or denominations, which limits the influence of socially conservative ideals. And the ties between the church and black culture run deep. Their union was formed when the church provided spiritual support for slaves in order to keep morale high, and the values of the black church tend to be socially conservative. In the home, traditional family values and gender roles prevail, such as a nuclear family with a man as the maid provider and a woman as the keeper of the house. Heterosexuality is seen as the only acceptable standard, while homosexuality is seen as condemnable by God. When this is combined with the hyper-masculine image that young black men are pressured to conform to, the hypersexual of black women in media and the use of slavery and Jim Crow laws to erase the community's history of homosexuality, supports of LGBTQ identities, and the creation of multiple gender identities, it creates a highly corrosive environment in which black trans women aren't allowed any space or even the ability to exist. If they live with a more traditionally religious family, they'll be ejected from their church and home and forced to live the kind of life that Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera know so well, which opens them up to police brutality, arrests due to the criminalization of sex work, sexual and or physical assaults, and a shorter average lifespan than white trans women like myself. There is a pandemic of killings of black trans women happening right now in this country, and I don't see nearly enough people talking talking about it. In 2019, 41% of black trans people reported having experienced homelessness, five times the rate of the general U.S. population, and 91% of the transgender or gender non-conforming people who were fatally shot were black women. Those are my sisters being killed out there, and they're the most marginalized group within modern society. But it seems there are white people within the LGBTQ community who would rather turn away than stop another senseless murder from happening. Racism is still prevalent in this community, whether we want to admit it or not, and we ourselves cannot move forward towards our own liberation if we refuse to acknowledge all of the ways in which we are tied to the black community. At the same time, more and more black trans women from within the Black Lives Matter movement have been loudly critical of its sluggishness to address violence against their trans siblings. In an interview with Vice, BLM co-founder Patrice Cullors said, Our movement collectively has not been as present for these murders. She sees a need for wider organization against anti-transgender violence within Black Lives Matter, allyship with the efforts of transgender activists, and support for Black trans women who are currently living. This writes here is one of the places where black liberation and trans liberation meet. In an article for the New York Times, writers Isabella Gruyon Paz and Maggie Astor said, These two movements are pulled together by extraordinary circumstances. The protests sparked by the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. The killings of two black trans women, Dominique Fells and Raya Milton, shortly after a black trans man, Tony McDade, was killed by police. A pandemic that has disproportionately affected people of color, an economic crisis that has disproportionately affected trans people, and a Supreme Court decision protecting gay and trans people from employment discrimination that all came to a head during Pride Month. The trans community as a whole still can't walk out their front door without being at risk of assault and or murder. We're still fighting the commodification and appropriation of pride and trans culture by rainbow capitalism. Evangelicals and those within the Trump administration would rather see us revert back to our pre-transition selves or be smitten by God himself. And people like myself sit at an interesting crossroads due to having two identities that are at odds with one another. Being white grants you more privilege and being trans grants you less. I exist within both at the same time, and how I'm treated in public comes down to where I am and who I happen to come across. Black trans people and trans people of color have the added pressure of institutional racism and even bigotry from within their own communities constricting their ability to exist 
that much more. It's intersectionality 101, and intersectionality itself is defined as a theoretical framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities might combine to create unique modes of discrimination and privilege. To say that someone is oppressed for one thing and one thing alone is incredibly reductionist in nature and belies the very nature of oppression itself. We're all being systematically targeted for things that are an intrinsic unchangeable part of us, from our age to our education level, our sexuality, whether we are abled or disabled, are old or young, what our gender identity or ethnicity is, and how we're affected by these intersecting forms of oppression is directly correlated by how we're affected by the matrix of domination, a sociological theory introduced by Patricia Hill Collins that's described as a way for people to acknowledge their privileges in society, how one is able to interact, what social groups one is in, and the networks one establishes is all based on different interconnected classifications. To sum it up, it's the idea that one cannot look at the individual facets of someone's identity, but rather that they are all interconnected. No one person is any one thing. We are multitudes contained within a single vessel, and in order for our activism to truly shift the paradigm in discussion around race, privilege, marginalization, gender, and these intersecting forms of oppression, we must acknowledge that even within one community, there is a broad array of lived experiences and each community itself is not a monolithic thing. We're all incredibly complex universes of being, and the very least that you as one person in one of these universes can do is study history, learn to see the ways in which history repeats itself, take the lessons from the past and apply them to the now, study the nature of oppression and all the different forms that intersectionality takes, and once you see the connections between events present and past and how they're affecting every marginalized community in very real ways today, take that knowledge and use it in whatever way you have the spoons for. Not everyone can engage in direct action and boots on the ground activists like those in Stonewall and the Civil Rights era did. But just sharing what you know with those around you can lead to a butterfly effect of awakenings and radicalizations and plot out the next steps in what will be a decades-long struggle. We have the momentum of history behind us. Don't waste this moment because we don't know when another chance will come. When we reach across community lines and join together in the fight for liberation, I'm not kidding when I say we'll be unstoppable, but that's just it. It's going to take everyone being willing to set aside any differences and ally for one common cause. Both the trans and black communities experience different kinds of marginalization and thus must pursue different ends in their own individual struggles. But we're both seeking one key thing. Liberation. We are in this together. We are comrades, family, and we share so many of these roots with one another. Never forget your connection to history and those who came before you, and don't let yourself be blinded to all the ways in which you are connected to those beyond your own community. It may not have been Marsha who threw the first brick, but black trans women did play a key role in the events leading up to and during Stonewall. In so many ways, people like myself, really do owe everything to them. Now, if you want to be an ally to either community, keep a few things in mind. There's a difference between speaking for a community and speaking over a community. It's okay to use your privilege to boost our voices, but if you yourself are not black or trans, you do not understand what our lived experiences are. You do not have an intrinsic understanding of blackness or transness, and you do not get to dictate our actions, what we choose to speak up on, or how we choose to protest. Don't co-opt our narrative for your own agenda. We've already seen organizations in Portland like Rose City Justice do this in order to gain money and clout, and to forcibly defang protesters who very much embody the revolutionary spirit of the Black Panthers, Gay Liberation Front, and Star. Portland's roots are soaked in poisonous neoliberalism and racism, and it always manifests in individuals and or groups who try to shove respectability politics and the white way of doing things into the conversation, even when we loudly object. Leave the grift the antagonizers, and all of those who would seek to undermine our efforts behind. Focus 
on what is most important. Our forward movements and the continued push into territory that was colonized by those who built the slave trade and force-fed traditional gender roles and values into society. We're going to be hit from both within and outside with attacks by more woke liberal types or those who want to sow division amongst us so we fracture and collapse before having the ability to affect true, long-lasting, systemic change. We cannot allow that to stop us or slow us down. Changing the material conditions for one community, let alone society as a whole, takes decades of continual, laborious, mentally and physically straining grassroots work. But to remove the hate from the heart of man and society is something we may never be able to do. What's important is that we all remember and repeat this mantra. Some people are black, get the fuck over it. Some people are trans, get the fuck over it. Some people are black and trans. You get where I'm going with this. The struggle for liberation has been ongoing for centuries and is arguably the most well-known story in the tome that is the history of humankind. And it will continue on. But every choice you make now will affect every single soul within your community and beyond. The march forward is a slow but steady one. And as long as we only do that which aids the fight for trans liberation, for black liberation, for the liberation of all marginalized peoples, we will will lay the foundations towards a truly beautiful future in which we are no longer lesser or inferior. We're just us. Equal. Human.